Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. As I've mentioned in a couple of recent videos, my goal this Black History Month is to explore the six chronological sections of the Zora Canon, a list of classic works of fiction and nonfiction by African American women writers. Last week, I read primarily from the second section, a section called A Rebirth of the Arts, covering the period from 1924 to 1953, focusing primarily on books written during the era of the Harlem Renaissance and the years immediately following it. If you're looking for a short introduction to the Harlem Renaissance, I highly recommend the recent video by Justin at the booktube channel Ghost Reader, a video which he put up just a day or two ago. Justin has been discussing topics in African American history and culture almost every day during February, and his whole collection of videos is really wonderful. If you're looking for a more detailed discussion of the Harlem Renaissance, you might check out the book Harlem Renaissance by the scholar Nathan Huggins. It's a long story, but Nathan Huggins was one of the main reasons I became an historian. And although I know I had his book on my shelves, it's no longer where I would think it would be, next to his 1977 book, Black Odyssey, about the effects of the Middle Passage and slavery on the developing culture and community of Black Americans. He published his study of the Harlem Renaissance in 1971, and is still a seminal work of American studies. His book is a fascinating read, quite critical of work he interprets as art created by Black authors and other artists, often for a primarily white audience, instead of representing their actual cultural experiences. Huggins' work has been both supported and critiqued by more contemporary scholars, including Henry Louis Gates Jr., who points out that Huggins does not acknowledge that the Harlem Renaissance was, in Gates' words, quote, surely as gay as it was black. Queer sexuality is certainly a major theme in much of the literature of the time, and I think that might be one of the things that is keeping works from the Harlem Renaissance so popular in the current moment. A bit more on that issue later, at least twice. In addition, Huggins gives short shrift to both the work produced by women authors and artists and to ideas about gender. He was writing before much of that kind of analysis was a major part of literary criticism. And he was writing before some of the Harlem Renaissance novels by women had been rediscovered and brought back into print. Nevertheless, Huggins' book is both well-written and interestingly argued. I think I may have to acquire a replacement copy for my personal library sometime soon. The first novel I read last week from this era was Nella Larson's short book, Passing, originally published in 1929. I was thrilled to see a discussion about the novel on the booktube channel Codex Cantina last week, and amazed to learn there that Larson's book is being made into a film, possibly to be released later this year. I'll link to Codex Cantina's video below. This is a story of the friendship between two light-skinned African-American women, Irene Redfield, who lives in Harlem with her Black husband, and Claire Kendry, who lives in Europe with her racist white husband. At the time of the book, she's living as a white woman, despite the fact that she grew up African-American, and her husband does not know about her background. Irene, on the other hand, is active in the Black community, but nevertheless passes for white when it suits her needs. Irene is disturbed by Claire's decision to pass full time, and that story is the primary passing to which the title of the novel refers. But of course, there are other meanings of the word passing, including the passing of a person from life to death. The word passing, when applied to identity, implies that there's some clear line of biological difference, that one is obviously black or white in this case, and choosing to pretend that one is not what one clearly is. I think our 21st century ideas about identity, racial as well as gendered, are much more fluid and complex. 
Nevertheless, we're often still filled with angst about hiding parts of ourselves, especially when we know that how we see ourselves conflicts with accepted society's norms in some way. And although racial passing is the overt plot in this novel, Larson lets us know from the very first chapter that she's discussing other kinds of transgression as well, especially sexuality. Claire Kendry was, quote, stepping always on the edge of danger, reaching out to pull Irene with her. We learn in the first few pages that Claire is longing to be with Irene, as she says, as I have never longed for anything before, and I've wanted many things in my life. Irene has given Claire her, quote, terrible, wild desire. I was really intrigued by how this book seems like a combination of Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby and what I've heard about Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Perhaps after I read Woolf's novel next month, I'll come back with more discussion of these unexpected connections. I'll try not to spoil the ending here. But near the ending of Larson's passing, as we stand with the characters at a crowded party filled with music blaring from a phonograph and people, quote, throwing nonsensical things into the pool of talk, we get a striking image. Irene finishing a cigarette and throwing the stub out the sixth floor window, quote, watching the tiny spark drop slowly down to the white ground below. We get this remarkable and quiet moment, and then all hell breaks loose and the party is disrupted with a very dramatic event. The book ends in ambiguity, ambiguity about what actually happened. And I was wondering what Larson was trying to say, too, what the connection to passing was, whether the action is a show of capitulation to a social norm or possibly even a show of strength fascinating. If you've read it, I'd love to hear what you think. One more thing. Larson's writing style is sometimes lyrical, but often feels pretty choppy, with lots of little phrases rather than full sentences. Sometimes it is propelling the text forward, but often it's off-putting. Still, the style mirrors the author's theme. She's using fragmented language to talk about fragmented identities. There are images of fragmented objects in the book as well, such as the, quote, white fragments of the broken teacup. I'm not convinced that the fragmented writing style is successful, but I do really like Larson's careful artistry in attempting it. For those who are intrigued by passing, Her short story, Quicksand, is also a must-read, and it's included in many editions along with Passing. Also, there's a widely respected biography, In Search of Nella Larson, a biography of the color line by George Hutchinson, a literary scholar who's also written a landmark study of the era of the Harlem Renaissance as a whole. I've read neither at least not beyond the introductions, but at some point I would especially love to learn more about Larson, partly because of what Hutchinson has to say about the creation of biographies about people who are ciphers. Let me read what he says at the outset, that he is presenting the kind of biography one writes about a person who's been invisible, the so-called mystery woman of the Harlem Renaissance, and about why she has been invisible. She seems to have had little interest in leaving a legacy, he says. In short, she was all but forgotten until her work was resurrected by literary scholars in the 1980s. Because of the dearth of information, Hutchinson says, quote, one turns of necessity to a different type of story in which the individual ego is not always central as the forces acting upon it. One can only at times reconstruct the settings in which the subject lived and summon her from their midst. Peering into the interstices, one must reverse the process by which the subject was overshadowed, hoping at the same time to expose those very processes. That is, think critically about how and why her legacy was almost lost. 
It sounds like a model for the kind of cultural biography that social historians write, works that have at least as much to say about the cultures in which people lived as they do about individuals themselves. In addition to reading Nella Larson's novel, I listened to the audiobook of Zora Neale Hurston's fantastic book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. The book has been one of my favorites for a long time, but this was my first time hearing the audio, narrated by Ruby D. I've said before that I often don't get on especially well with audiobooks, but this one is absolutely fantastic. For me, Knowing the book fairly well before I listened was really helpful, I think. But I can imagine that for readers struggling with Hurston's representation of speech and accent, Dee's superb reading might make the text more accessible. I highly recommend it, whichever direction you choose to go. Since I went on and on about passing, and so many other people are talking about it, And so many other people are talking about their eyes who are watching God right now. I think I'll leave my discussion of that book for another time. Oh, one more thing. If you're a Zora Neale Hurston fan, make sure you also read her story Sweat, which you can find online or in the newly published collection, Hitting a Straight Lick with a Colored Stick. After you read it, check out Brian's video on the story, which you can find on his booktube channel, Bookish. And don't miss the interesting discussion in the comments. Well, after reading and thinking a lot about Black women writers and their works this week, I was pleased to run across the discussion of Claude McKay's, quote, new book, uh, Romance in Marseille, which I first learned about in a review by Brent Hayes Edwards in the New York Times, and then saw my favorite critic, Michael Durda, review it in the Washington Post. McKay is sometimes referred to as one of the thinkers who really started the Harlem Renaissance with his 1922 book of poetry, Harlem Shadows. Although he probably penned Romance in Marseille just a decade or so later, the novel has just been published for the first time. In his book review, Edwards suggests that more than most writers of early 20th century America, McKay was a forerunner of today's global world, an international Negro, as W.E.B. Du Bois put it. Issues of international migration and immigration, especially when infected by racist assumptions, are at the heart of this book, making it sound like this century-old book is especially relevant at this moment. And other contemporary issues, from disability to queer sexuality, get framed in ways that seem like they might fit better today than they would have at the time. Both disability and same-sex desire are seen not as sources of angst or agony, but as locations of strength, independence, and pleasure. Before I wrap up today's video, I want to go back to the first section of the Zora canon for a moment, which I talked about in my previous video. I just read a really interesting article by Henry Louis Gates Jr. about Harriet Wilson's book, Our Nig, a book I read as a free download on my ancient e-reader, but which has recently been published with an extensive introduction by Gates. I searched for a library copy with no log, but eventually found Gates' introduction in a collection of essays. The first half of the intro talks about Wilson's life, as well as the history of the book's reception. The second part is a meditation on the book itself, considering how the book addresses common literary themes in women's fiction, such as marriage and motherhood, as well as analyzing how Wilson uses her novel as a form of social commentary and as a path towards financial independence. I thought that one of the most interesting sections in the Gates essay was where he compares the plot structure of Our Nig to other 19th century fiction by white women, a frame the literature scholar Nina Baim outlines in her study, Woman's Fiction, A Guide to Novels by and About Women in America, 1829 to 1870. I was unfamiliar with her outline, what she calls the overplot, 
that almost all novels of the genre basically followed. Her description starts with the device of pairing heroines, something we see in Nella Larson's work as well, or a heroine and a female villain. In many books, there's a flawless heroine as well as a flawed one. Bame lays out 15 steps in this kind of novel, kind of a variation on a growing up Billingsroman story. I'm so eager to think about how this idea of an overplot might be constituted if it were to apply to other genres and other times and places. And I really want to read Bame's book to learn more about her analytical style. Interestingly, Gates suggests that Harriet Wilson was clearly aware of the essence of Bame's overplot, but she turns it on its head, allowing her to create a new kind of novel, one with the transformation, as Gates writes, from black as object to black as subject. In other words, at least according to Gates, Harriet Wilson was central in the development of a truly African-American literary tradition. Coming up soon on this channel, I'm planning to talk about selections from the next few chronological periods of the Zora list. Thanks for joining me today here on Hannah's Books. See you soon.